Welcome to the Your Alana Nation pregame show. Brett Barons and Derek Piper here live outside Bankers Life Fieldhouse as the Alana are getting set for an early morning matchup against Loyola in the second round. A spot in the Sweet 16 for the first time since 2005 on the line today for the Alana, Derek. And what is hopefully a fun matchup. I know the teams are trying to like downplay it a little bit that, hey, the in state thing and the, the lower level, you know, mid major school against the big dog state school and all that. I'm not. I, I think it's great. Let's hype it up. Let's let's make it for all that it is. And it's it's we've got a what seems at least to be on the surface a fun game in store for today. Yeah, absolutely. Why wouldn't all of us on the outside fully embrace this? And Loyola, I mean, they're experienced in this tournament. You got Lucas Williamson and Cameron Crutwig, who are the winningest players, four-year players in Loyola history, been to a Final Four. Uh, Illinois trying to get to their own, you know, deep steps into the tournament, and, and like you said, trying to reach the Sweet 16 first time in 16 years. So you kind of got that correlation there going go. there. But uh, it'll be a sweet Sunday for somebody. And. Very fun matchup. I think that we'll break it all down, but Loyola can do some things to make things tough. They're great defensively, got some three-point shooters, have an All-American big man in, in Crutwig. Uh, but I, I do think that while he is very, very good and while he's had a great season, he hasn't seen anybody like the big fella and Kofi down low. So that, that'll be an interesting matchup. And we'll break this all down coming up, and I want to get your thoughts on Crutwig versus Kofi because two All-Americans there and two guys that are very capable of scoring and doing things and making it tough on opponents. It seems to be a common thread, Dick. We've said that a lot. These teams haven't seen a guy like Kofi Coburn. Yeah. And, you know, we, we discussed that on Friday, too, but it's like out of the Big Ten where everyone's scouted so well, everyone knows Kofi's name, I feel like his game is going to be elevated in that sense because people are going to see him for the first time. You've got a lot of casual fans that maybe haven't followed Illinois in a long time, especially this year, kind of tuning in now on a national CBS game today. You can watch this game starting at 11.10 Central Time right here on WCIA 3. And so... I feel like his stock, in a sense, is elevated, and name maybe is a better way to put that. Um, certainly elevated coming into this game, and in, as we go along in the tournament, people starting to congregate out here outside the stadium. And I've seen quite a few Loyola shirts, a lot more orange shirts today. Take me back, though, as we start here to Friday. There was a limited amount of people in the arena, a small arena, IUPUI's home court. What was that atmosphere like to be in there? And how different was it than like the Big Ten tournament now as we look back and reflect? Yeah, it was quite a bit different. It okay. was a very intimate atmosphere as far as how many people could be in there. Just a small venue, as you mentioned. And while Illinois was definitely repped pretty well as far as what fans could get in there, there just weren't a whole lot of people uh, in that building. And Lucas Oil was a big venue and spaced out right. and everything. Yeah. But you could just hear the roars of that crowd. And, and they weren't as maybe powerful as they were um, at the Big Ten tournament. Then again, it's a little bit different when you're going up against an Ohio State or uh, an Iowa versus Drexel, where I, I know that game was a little tighter than you would have liked for the first 15 minutes. But after that, it, it was really a blowout and, and no no kind of sweat in the second half. So uh, Illinois showed out strong as far as their fan base. We know that's going to be true in the, in the case the rest of the way. And, and it'll be interesting to see NBA venue, more fans in there. I'm sure it'll be lively today, like you said, though. And a lot of storylines in this one. Looks like both squads will be wrapped pretty well in the fan base. Yeah, and that's great. That's what you want, right? This is getting us back to what the quote-unquote how it used to be type of thing, you know? And I expect there'll be four or 5,000 fans inside today at 25% capacity, I think it is, for each venue. Obviously, this one's bigger than the Indiana Farmers Coliseum in, in name alone, the Pacers play here, right? You can see the, the banners behind us. Um, did the start at all concern you, Derek, on Friday? Because we had talked about that on the pregame show. I wanted to see Illinois come out strong and really impose its will early. They didn't do that. They had two points in the first four minutes of the game. Is there any hangover effect there? Do you think it was just maybe settling into some nerves coming into the game? Yeah, I think that, that was somewhat to be expected. Not a, a terrible surprise when you think about Illinois. And I wondered if there was any kind of a, a Big Ten tournament hangover. I think it right. was to what Brad Underwood said, just – some nervousness, some understanding of the moment. You're all of a sudden in win and go home mode, and this is something that they've been talking about a long time. You see March Madness plastered on the floor, center yeah. court. You, you know it's on. You know it's the, it's the real deal. And yeah, it took them a while to, to get into the flow. Maybe rush some things offensively. Io struggled uh, through the first 10, 12 minutes of that game. Didn't get on the board uh, until late in that first half. So uh, I, I think that it's great when you're a one seed. You can get that out of your system against a 16 who 
probably doesn't have the firepower to, for the full 40 minutes, keep up with you. We definitely saw that. I did like Illinois' defensive effort, and that's something that we've been saying for a long time here the last two months. Yeah. I thought that was encouraging, uh, and, and just the way they responded, because we saw Baylor had a slow start against Hartford. Ohio State had a slow start against Oral Roberts. That ended up costing them. Did not them. work out well. Right. So <laughs> to be able to prevail, to end up having a 29-point win, uh, you certainly feel good about that. And I think that they probably shook some of that emotion and just some of that initial response to the madness. And I think they'll be locked in today. Yeah, I would expect that today, even with the early start here, so to speak, uh, coming in. And Illinois adjusted to the Eastern time now. They've been here a week plus and, you know, the, the noon game here on the Eastern time. And maybe one thing else about today, Derek, it's way warmer today yeah. than it was on Friday morning when we were out on the north end of town there. Windy, cold. Uh, the sun feels good today. We'll be inside, obviously, for the game. But I feel like there's just a, a good atmosphere, a good buzz starting to gather around here outside Baker's Life Fieldhouse. All right. How's your bracket, by the way? Oh, it's uh, it's pretty rough. I had Texas in the, not only the <laughs> Final Four. I mean, you, you know, I think you saw yeah. uh, in the championship game. So that was a, a tough one to take. Can we get Andy to take down the he, – he, Andy also put together all the brackets for us on a web page. I think we might need to scrub that and get that off our website yeah. for all the haters out there. That, let's my bracket is terrible, by the way. Scrub that link from well. the, the surface of the internet. Let's, yeah. just, let's get it out point, of here. At this point, I'm just happy that uh, we've got some upsets. Because, look, yes, you want to see some teams advance and some higher teams for some good quality basketball later on. But in the first round, like, I'll be damned on my bracket. Let's just see some upset. That's what March is about, right? Let's have some fun in that. I want an Oral Roberts to win, a North Texas, you know, uh, Abilene Christian last night. You know, and these Big Ten teams really didn't have a good Friday overall. I thought yesterday was a bounce back a little bit uh, for what it was. And I'm still in the Sunday is the final day of the first and second round type of thing. It's just a little weird of a schedule. So the second round really doesn't end until tomorrow. It's going to be weird having Monday second round basketball yeah. in the NCAA tournament. It's going to be even weirder next week because the Sweet 16 games don't start till Saturday. So Saturday, Sunday, Sweet 16 games, Elite Eight games, Monday, Tuesday. It's just kind of a weird feeling. Have you, how have you adjusted to all that? We just show up when we're told yeah, to show right, up. Hey, right that's kind of the deal. It doesn't feel right. The team who's rolling in. It doesn't feel right that tomorrow's a work day. I mean, for well, us. Today's a work today's day. Today's a work day, so it, it's different for us. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I mean – we haven't been covering this in a tournament in a while, so I'm not, I can't say that we were setting our ways yeah, too heavily. Right, yeah, that's we're, true. We're just here to, to finally cover it. Normally, Derek, we just sit here and watch the games <laughs> and enjoy it. Now right. there's quote-unquote work here, which we're obviously happy to do, and, and covering a good team is always fun. As I said, just the DeSumo family uh, rolling in here. I know they're going to be allowed today and certainly enjoying themselves being in Indy uh, for this extended stay and, and for the Illini. All right, let's get to this matchup because everyone knows Cameron Crotwig's name and what he's able to do. He's had an outstanding career at Loyola, one of their best players of all time. It if not the best player in school history for them. Um, let's start with that because I think it starts with the big men. What does he do well, and what should people be watching out for with Cameron Crutwig against Kofi? Yeah, offensively, he's a really unique player and that he can play inside out, not necessarily in terms of his jump shot, okay. but in the post, he's, he's old school. Right? He's not a guy that's elevating above the rim or anything. Like He's a lumbering big man, 6'9", 240, 245. Uh, great footwork, nice touch, especially with the left hook that he wants to get to. But he can definitely face you up. And I think sure. that that's what he's going to look to do against Kofi because I'm sure he's not going to have a whole lot of success of backing him down and trying to move him. And then also just Kofi with his length can really contest his shots. So I think Crutwig has got to be able to adjust by – facing him up, trying to jab step him, pump fake him. And then also he facilitates a ton of the offense around the top of the key. They run dribble handoffs. He's a very exceptional passer. Uh, so he's really, really involved as far as just everything that they do. Everything runs through him. And it's going to be interesting. Also off the ball, and I know we're going to, we're going to talk about William Sitter, we're going to talk about Braden Norris, really good three-point shooters. They like to run cuts off of the action when Crutwick has it. And you just got to be sound. And Kofi's got to be able to – be disciplined, not get in foul trouble, and just own that one-on-one -on -one matchup so the other guys can focus entirely on those shooters. Do you expect Crutwig to get a one-on-one -on -one matchup with Kofi, or, or how do you expect them to kind of attack the post presence for the Atlanta? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I, I think that's the, the matchup that makes the most sense. Uh, I think that Kofi, while Crutwig and Loyola's defensive numbers are outstanding, just the sheer size, that, and we talk about that. Like you said, we, it's a it's right, a broken yeah. record when we go over and over this with Kofi. But uh, feeding him on the block, I, I, he's going to have the opportunity. You know, having a three-inch 
difference to be able to finish over right. Crutwig and, and also in the pick and roll. I think you can kind of exploit him a little bit there. But yeah, defensively, I think it is going to be on Kofi to to guard him, contain him. Of course, if there is foul trouble or even when Kofi's on the bench, you have Georgie, who's fairly like size with Crutwig, uh, giving up a few pounds there. But uh, yeah, that is the, the matchup where you have second team All-American in Kofi, third team All-American in Crutwig. And if foul trouble is an issue, and once again, this is on repeat, right? We keep saying these things, but I think that's where it all starts. Like, that's important for Illinois to really set the tone and, and get that inside presence, especially uh, how teams are going to guard him. Because if Kofi can kick it out or, you know, if he can do some different things, I think it just presents so many more options uh, for the Illini offense and, and what they're able to do. Uh, what about, you know, the other factors for Loyola? You know, Lucas Williamson obviously is, is a great player right and what he's able to do what other options do they have and what's what's other couple names to look out for Williamson for sure now he's the Missouri Valley defensive player of the year so that's definitely one to watch the matchup against him and Io I think that he's going to try to check him for most of that game and just with his length and athleticism he's really going to have a chance to keep Io in front make his shots difficult get a hand in his face and that's where I would look for a guy like Trent a guy like Curbelo to really facilitate a lot and really need to step up today. But offensively for Loyola, as I mentioned, they're a good three-point shooting team, in particular their point guard and Braden Norris shoots it over 40%. Uh, they have Clemens, Keith Clemens as the two guard, 46% from three. Those guys run off a lot of screens. And, and Loyola runs some beautiful offense sometimes just with their actions. Uh, I mentioned their cuts, but they really do a good job of putting their shooters in good positions by running them off screens. Crutwood can find them in the corner or dribble handoffs where they come around and he kind of shields the defender and allows a three point behind him. So uh, Norris kind of reminds me, and I think Loyola in general kind of has that Wisconsin makeup sure. where they're not as, not as athletic as some teams, but just very disciplined, well coached, and have a, a guy like Norris who I think is similar to a Ben Bruss that we saw at Wisconsin. And I would expect him, it's a good comparison to Wisconsin, just try and slow this thing down. Right. I mean, similar yeah. to what Drexel was trying to do. Obviously, Loyola is a different level than Drexel. But like if they can come in and muck it up a little bit and try and slow it down, I think that favors to Loyola, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, for sure. That, that's where they're comfortable. They're very methodical in their offense. Right. They want to run it deep into the shot clock. And when you can limit possessions, it, it gives an opportunity. They talk about it, it, it's more. There's more variance or more volatility when you limit possessions, and uh, that's kind of how uh, a lower seed can stick around uh, against a, a one seed or a team that might have more talent. Where, and then, of course, just as far as being comfortable, like you said, Illinois wants to go up and down. They want to yeah. get pace. They want to kind of feel that up and down and feel like they're in control of the tempo. If Loyola is able to slow it down and, and make it a grinded-out type of game, they'll be really in their comfort zone. And we saw it last night with Texas and Abilene Christian they, you know, ACU really does not turn it over very much and forces a ton of turnovers. Texas turned it over 20 plus times and ends up losing. And it's just the recipe for success here. A lot of these teams that are mid-major or lower levels have to find a way to compete and mix it up and do things differently and force their opponents who are way more talented than them by and large to do things that they don't want to do or are not very good at. And so I think that's a concern. And we've seen turnovers be an issue for this team for Illinois this year uh, at certain points along the way, although they have done better here in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, they certainly have. And you look at Andre Corbello, who I know the Big Ten tournament only had five turnovers in three games. I mean, there have been games this year where he's had five or six in one. So at a half, <laughs> right? it, it, it's just what it seems or at least like. Sometimes right? it feels like it. Yeah. Even if he doesn't turn it over, if he gets it back, the the ball's at least loose, which doesn't sit well with a lot of Illini fans. Even if it doesn't result in one in a turnover. Right. Absolutely. And Io's been subject to some turnovers at times as well. Uh, they have taken the care of the ball a lot better here of late. Uh, but like you said, against a very Sound defense. Brad mentioned how good they are in the passing lanes. Got very active hands. They rotate really well. If you turn it over and all of a sudden they're gonna, Loyola's gonna get the ball. I mean, they're they're not bad in transition. I know yeah. you look at their their tempo numbers. They do have the ability to push it uh, when the numbers advantage is there for them. But even if it's just a wasted possession, all of a sudden Loyola's gonna eat 20 seconds off the shot clock, run their offense, and, and get a good look. All of a sudden, uh, time can kind of tick down. And Illinois, who wants to score, you know high 70s, 80, uh, they're, they're not doing what they want to do if, the, if that's the case, they're making those mistakes. How much has Andre Corbello come in the last even couple of weeks here, month, and how much has he continued to surprise you with his confidence and what he's able to do? I forget he's a freshman sometimes. Yeah, I mean, his confidence doesn't necessarily surprise me. Now, it's just 
having it channeled the right way Correct. and making yeah, the right the kind of plays. That's the distinction there, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's aggressive. <laughs> yeah. That guy is, is trying to, to make any possible play and, and has the belief in himself that he's going to be able to make that pass. And I think the game has slowed down for him. Yeah. I think he has always been able to be a guy that's so quick off the dribble, he can almost get to any spot on the floor that he wants. Now it's whether well, the ball is under control and he's just kind of reading the defense correctly. I think he's shown a lot more patience and just kind of manip manipulating his defender and even other defenders to kind of create a look for the big man. Uh, he, he's just playing at a very high level and he has a mature basketball IQ. That's something that we talked about a lot coming out of high school. But now that the game has slowed down, that he kind of has the experience of knowing what it's going to look like here in college, what he can do, what he can't do. Uh, he certainly benefited from that, but yeah, he's still going to make the flashy play, like throwing it through someone's legs like he did against Drexel. And how uh, about that? was that? just ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, that was really impressive stuff when you look back at that. Just his court awareness, which I feel like he's always been pretty good at. It doesn't mean that he executed every time when he hit that proverbial freshman wall back in early January, late December. It was like, Okay, let's. How do we perceive him? You know, how 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 should fans kind of look at him? And there was question marks there, and then he makes these plays, you know, like through the defender's legs on Friday, and you're like, there ain't many guys doing that. <laughs> I mean, especially the freshman, but that that's in a class of his own, so to speak, and it's really cool to see his development. and And I think also, and I'm not trying to get ahead here, Derek, but it also gives you a lot of confidence for next year. That, that not only on the recruiting trail, which we can talk about too, and, and Illinois picks up another uh, recruit in the first one for class of 2022, but like whoever they have, he's going to put them in a position to be successful next year. Cut the clip up. <laughs> yeah, right? Like that's all they have to do, isn't it? I mean, you, if you're the coaching staff, hey, look at this kid. Hey, yeah. you want to see this? Let me send you a quick Twitter video. Yeah, that's it. As far as someone that can elevate your game, someone that's a pass first point guard, you're never going to question whether Carbello's out there trying to get right. his. He wants to make the right play, and he takes greatest satisfaction out of throwing a lob to a big man or uh, skipping it to a shooter when they're right. open. And, and yeah, that's great. That's what you want to be a part of. He's a high level facilitator, going to be at Illinois, you would think, for a couple more years, uh, maybe even a four year guy. And absolutely, that's that's something that's gives you a lot of confidence for the future. Not only him and then Adam Miller as he progresses. I liked some of the offensive flashes that Adam showed. It's good to see him knock down some open shots. And those two in particular going forward, I mean, there's that's what gives you a lot of confidence. That's what happens when you recruit two top 50 guards in the right. same class and you pair them together. Yeah, right. Good things are going to happen more times than not with a lot of talent on your roster. Uh, quickly, tell us about class of 2022 recent commit Reggie Bass. Yeah, he's a 6'4", 6'5", big guard combo guard who can play a little bit on the ball a little bit off of it uh, probably more of a two than a one but he does have the ability to facilitate uh, take the ball off the dribble get to the rim uh, he's a lefty a, a decent shooter okay. uh, I think he can continue to, to be an even better one at that and uh, they just love his basketball IQ his passing uh, his ability you, you know that Corbello is going to be the guy like running the offense and everything right. but when there's a situation to if, they, if, a, if a team tries to commit multiple defenders to him to bottle him up, you can kick it to Bass, and he's going to make a play not only for himself but for, for some others. And also I think that he has some good upside defensively just with his length. He's a really long defender and, and moves pretty well. So I, I know he's only a three-star, and, and you kind of got to take rankings with a little bit of grain of salt because – I'll be honest, we ha I know from personal experience, we just haven't gotten to see a lot of these high school recruits here a whole lot recently, but it is an early take, but it it's one that I know that the Atlanta staff feels good about. And did it surprise you in the timing in that sense that they were willing to take him now, or does that just generate some more hype for that 2022 class, which I'll be honest, Derek, I haven't looked that far ahead. This is why you're the recruiting guru <laughs> here. What does their scholarship situation look like in 2022, knowing that there's a lot of variables still? Yeah, it is really dependent on what they're going to do the rest of the way here, 2021, yeah. also the transfer market. If you were to add a Brandon Podzimski, the shooter from long lefty shooter from Wisconsin, that's obviously a four-year scholarship. Uh, Namari Burnett or a Ty Ty Washington, they, they want to add an impact combo guard in this in this cycle for next year. For next year. Remember, this is for two years from now. This yeah. is 2022. Correct. So they're, they're getting ahead in a sense. So the amount of guys they add here for next year, especially because with transfers, you can add multi-year guys, not worry about sitting out. There's more right. of a willingness to do that. Uh, it, that will really determine how it shakes out with the scholarships. And of course, you're going to have some attrition. You're going to have probably some guys on this team that, yeah. that aren't here next year, maybe one, maybe two. Uh, but yeah, I look at Jaden Shutt in state, six foot five shooter. I personally questioned, I was like, do you want to take a Reggie Bass if you're going to be all in on shut? Does he 
get dissuaded by that at all right. by, by taking a guy his position so early. But uh, you got to trust the staff as yeah. far as the fan base. I think that they've earned that. And uh, but yeah, I think it was kind of an interesting situation. But he wanted to go early, and, and they were happy to take him. More work for DP here on a busy weekend already. When that popped on Friday, I'm sure you're like, "What, really? Come on now!" Yeah, no I'm, kidding, man. I had to stop. I got I got recruiting breakdown stuff to do, plus pregame, <laughs> plus postgame. I didn't even busy get guy. outside of Indianapolis. I had to pull over and get the laptop out. Yeah, fire up the fire uh, up the hotspot hot spot and uh, get on going. Yeah, we don't have enough things to cover here. <laughs> when Alana, it, the Illini beat right now. When it rains, it pours, and I guess that's a good thing in this in this sense to to get to this point. Uh, the Chancellor here, Robert Jones, walking in for the game today. I saw him on Friday as well uh, at the game at Indiana. Uh, Farmers Coliseum, but hey, it's great. Considering where we were out last year, and I, I try and put that in perspective, Derek, too, is like, what was I doing a year ago from today? Not a lot. I don't know, cleaning the garage, like trying to figure out what the heck we were going to do for content for what I thought might have been a couple of months. Turned out to be like six before oh, we had some legit content again with Illinois football coming and stopping and then going again. But uh, it's it's great. Look, here we are, right? That's what we said on Friday with covering an NCAA tournament game. And the Illini trying to extend more than just today and get to that Sweet 16 for the first time in 16 years. Every 16 years, Illinois has been in a Final Four, Derek. It's pretty good. And when you look back at the history, we'll see where this team can be. All right, uh, as we work along here, we're counting down to tip off now let's see Derek we've got about one hour from right now Illinois will take the court and let's get to some predictions what do you think Illinois Loyola today I think Vegas has it about seven how are you feeling about uh, this game Illinois in general who I feel like is the more confident team but still getting to a point where they can come out and, and win a game and make some more history yeah, I think that when you look at it on paper, or even some fans would say, oh, an eight seed in Loyola and, and don't have the athleticism coming from the Missouri Valley, this could be a blowout. And it does have that potential if Illinois plays at their peak. I mean, they've blown out some good teams in the Big yeah. Ten here of late. But I, you look around the NCAA tournaments, the underdogs are feisty. Th those <laughs> those higher seeds, yeah. lower seeds, I mean, I always get confused by that. The, the higher numbers of seeds yeah. are having some success here. So uh, I think that Loyola, with their defense, uh, with slowing the game down can be uh, a close game, particularly in the first half. I expect Illinois ultimately, with Kofi, the size advantage inside, uh, with uh, Frazier, Curbelo, their guard play, I think, has the advantage. I think Illinois pulls away in the second half. I have Illinois 75, Loyola 64. A little, I think it's definitely going to be lower scoring, and we were both off in a sense from Friday's matchup. They, they put up a ton of points there, obviously, and but uh, you know they still come out and get the 29-point win, which ties for the second highest win in NCAA tournament history, which is pretty impressive in that sense for for the Alana. They are making some history. I don't know how you feel about this 8-9 game, but like just when I look at brackets and everything else, for some reason for me, the 8-9 game is like a little testy in that sense. And I don't know if that's like just weird that I feel that way. I don't know how you feel about it, but it's like that that eight nine matchup in Loyola feels like it should be higher than an eight seed. I'm sure you know they're a ranked team and they've had a great season, but like I don't know. For me, it's just weird. It's like there's something in that eight nine game where the teams are good, but they're not great, but they're still uh, dangerous. If that makes sense. Do, do you get that sense at all, or am I just? talking out in left field no i mean I, I definitely agree with you as far as having the potential to be dangerous you look at baylor's getting a wisconsin team that's, that's pretty solid as far as the one seed against uh the eight or nine or whatever they were i think they were, yeah. they were the eight uh lsu on the, going up against michigan's a team that's got a lot of firepower and while loyola's on the eight nine line they're number nine in ken Palm. so this right, is a, yeah this is a team nine overall like sure yeah. this is a team that's uh the the efficiency numbers and all that love this team uh, they've had a great run of success. They've won 18 out of the last 19 games, uh, proven in the tournament with a couple of their veterans. Uh, so, yeah, I, I fully agree with you that they have the potential not only to make it close, to, to give it a challenge. And an upset wouldn't – it might shock you a little bit. But. Oh, I think it would definitely shock people. It's just the sense of it wouldn't be, like, all that surprising. You know, yeah. like there, there's the shock factor of this team expects to go to the Final Four because they've said that all year long, and, and they, ha they certainly have the talent to do that. But, you know, once you get past that first game, I just feel like it's OK. You know, you're starting to get into the meat of that a little bit where all these other teams and not all, but like there's certainly some other teams where in that first game, you're playing a, a really good team, you know, and I, I don't know. It's just something that I've always thought about. But. As Brad said yesterday, everybody's good here. Yeah, sure. They're winners. Yeah.
Right. They're, yeah. they're, here, for a we they're here for a reason. You're not here, and even Drexel, who was under 500 in its conference, right? But they still went on a run and proved that they could win their conference and, and get to this point. Derek, I think this is lower scoring as well. I think Illinois will hit 70, but I think that's going to win the game if uh, Loyola really slows down possessions. I got Illinois 71, Loyola uh, 65. I think it's going to be close, and I think Illinois will pull away in the end, but I think they will be tested today. And I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily either. Uh, they're not going to win every game in the tournament by 29 points. They're not going to win every game essentially in double digits, right? I, I don't know if it's necessarily a bad thing that they come out and, and play a, a lower scoring type of game, grind it out. Defense, turnover, possessions, all of that really important to kind of set themselves up for next weekend. Derek and I both with Illinois today. In the 70s, that's where this team has shown it can win games this year. Um, I think back to that uh, even Maryland game, 66-63, it was, it was a lower scoring possession. But I do feel like, Derek, this team is so much farther along than it was back to that point. You know, and, and I think even in a matchup like Baylor now, when you start to look at, and I don't know if you've gone back and looked at that tape at any time recent, but like, w if we go back and look at that in a game that was played here at this same building, right? And you were at that game, weren't you? Yeah, I was. Yeah, so we, they didn't have uh, any local TV in for that game, and they don't today either, but it is what it is. So I feel like this team has taken so many more steps to get to where they are now defensively. And that's, I think, what should give fans confidence. Oh, absolutely. And, and you look at, Brad's talked about it a lot, the fact that Adam Miller made, he had his, by his count, 10 mistakes defensively on his own in that game. Yeah. Uh, Curbelo's a whole different type of player. Not only, I mean, he had a success in that game offensively, but in terms of the trust level you have on defense, right. Grandison, uh, earlier in the season, we talked about him being a defensive liability. I haven't heard that discussion here recently because it seems like he's been pretty darn solid. Yeah. But uh, there's no doubt this team has flipped the switch. Uh, they're on a, a different level right now. It's, it's funny when even they scuffle a little bit for 15 minutes, like, well, I don't recognize this team based yeah. on what they've been doing. That's just how high of a level they've been playing at. No uh, and we know that when they get stops, they get out and run. Uh, they're, they're an absolute handful. Let's see what happens today. Illinois and Loyola in less than an hour now, Derek. Uh, 55 minutes from now, they will tip off here at Banker's Life Fieldhouse. Make sure to check out Derek's content on Illini Inquirer. He's got a golden ticket, one of the lucky five to get in on the Illinois media contingent. He'll have all sorts of content throughout the game with the live blog, right? Absolutely, yeah. And then get after the started. game as well. They're keeping him busy. Thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> you know, you got, you got enough stuff to do. But I'm going to hope we're going to do this again on Saturday. Let's Next Saturday, on. let's plan on it. Illinois pregame show and if we can get another great matchup you know i think that another oklahoma state illinois hey. can, can we speak it into existence i'm down i'd love to break totally that game down. down next saturday and i assume that's going to be a saturday game wouldn't you keep keep the same schedule i would but, imagine i don't know we don't know that for sure but that's what i'm going to assume that it would be on saturday all right make sure to check out Derek's stuff at illini inquire we'll have all your coverage coming up tonight on air on the late news it's going to be late because of all these games we've got illinois loyola on CBS, though, you can watch that right here on WCIA in less than an hour. For Derek, I'm Brett. Thanks so much for watching the Your Alana.